So what is sepsis? Let's go through sepsis, the theoretical aspects, and then we'll look at the guidelines from uh, surviving sepsis guidelines, and then we discuss how we manage this patient. So sepsis is a life-threatening organ dysfunction characterized by a dysregulated host response to an infection. And as we can understand, sepsis is responsible for about a third of ICU admissions all over the world. And definition of sepsis has undergone two major revisions since it was first published in 1992. And the newest definition was published in 2016 uh, by Singer et al. in sepsis 3 purple. Okay. So when we are dealing with patients with sepsis, there are three priorities in the approach uh, that would uh, help with reducing the mortality and saving lives. So the priorities are early recognition with prompt disease stratification and rapid treatment initiation and prevention and support of organ dysfunction. Basically, this deals with oxygen delivery to the uh, tissues and we aim for optimizing it and rapid infection source control on um, as soon as possible and immediate administration of adequate antimicrobial therapy plus or minus surgical or instrumental intervention to, to control the source. So WHO realizes the importance of uh, sepsis and it has announced an action plan as sepsis causes, um, sepsis is responsible for at least one in every five deaths all over the world. And it also has found that there are um, multiple gaps in the knowledge, which is hampering the treatment of sepsis, and it is killing at least 11 million people every year, and even more people are disabled all over the world. So it's a syndromic response. When there is an infection, it's a syndromic response of the body. And it is frequently a final common pathway to death in many infectious diseases around the world. And it's not easy uh, to ascertain the global burden because the patient reporting system is uh, not, um, is not um, complete and concrete in all the nations, but there are estimates about the burden of the sepsis. And there is significant regional variations based on the economic status of the countries. And approximately 85% of the sepsis cases and sepsis deaths worldwide occur in low and middle income countries. And as we all know, it can be the infections can be contacted in the community setting or in the healthcare setting. The patient may, may be admitted for some other problem, not infection. And once he's admitted to hospital, he might uh, come in contact with an infection and it might result in sepsis. And this is usual phenomenon. We see significant patients of uh, hospital acquired infections. So who are the patients or people at risk of sepsis? So as we can understand any infection or serious injury and uh, some non-communicable diseases also can progress to sepsis, but certain population, they're more vulnerable to sepsis. Not everyone, not every infection can become sepsis. We come across multiple infections like common colds, um, and not every patient with common cold progress to pneumonia, and not every pneumonia progresses to sepsis that we all understand anyway. So who are the patients or people at risk? So those who are elderly, pregnant patients or who has become pregnant recently in months, uh, days babies, neonates, hospitalized patients and patients, especially on intensive care units, 
people with HIV and AIDS, liver cirrhosis, cancers, kidney disease, autoimmune diseases, and people with no spleen. These are supposed to be high risk, higher risk patients for developing heart progressing into sepsis. And what are the signs and symptoms? So we all know fever and uh, uh, fe fevers are lower temperatures and shivering, altered mental status, difficulty in breathing or rapid breathing, increased heart rate, weak pulse, and low blood pressure, low urine output, patient being cyanotic or mottled, cold extremities and extreme body pain or discomfort. There some of the signs and symptoms of sepsis. And suspecting sepsis is probably the first major step towards early recognition and diagnosis. Unless you suspect and look for it or think of it, you may miss sepsis for a significant time. And to educate the public, sepsis as a pneumonic, um, these are the symptoms like shivering with fever or very cold, extreme pain or general discomfort, patient being very pale or discolored, sleepy and difficult to rouse and confused, and patient may feel like he might die and feeling short of breath. So this is a mnemonic where a patient can think of sepsis or a treating doctor can think of sepsis when he comes across a patient with such um, symptoms and signs. And if we look at sepsis, there are various uh, steps of progression. It can be simple SIRS, that is temperature, temperature more than 100.4 or less than 96.8 degrees Fahrenheit, temperature more, uh, respiratory rate more than 20 or 22, white cell count more than 12,000 or less than 4,000, or if you're doing a peripheral smear, if you're doing a peripheral smear, more than 10% of band forms, more than 10% of band forms in the peripheral smear, and this carbon dioxide less than 32 millimeters of mercury. And then two features of SIRS and confirmed or suspected infection would we can call it sepsis. And sepsis is called severe if there are signs of end organ damage, which can also include hypotension of systolic blood pressure less than 90. And if you get to do a blood gas or lactate levels more than four millimoles per liter, that is called severe sepsis. And it is called shock, a septic shock, if the patient's hypotension is persisting or lactate levels are persisting persistently higher than four millimoles of four milligrams per liter. So what happens in sepsis? When there is infection, the body recognizes the invading pathogen and microbial, microbial pattern proteins and develops an inflammatory response and releases mediators in order to control the invading pathogen. This is what we, happens in all, all the human beings or living organisms. An inflammatory response, fight, for, fight against the invading pathogen. And we all would assume that this fight of the host is going to kill the pathogen. And that is what is what this mechanism is expected at. But unfortunately, we also understand that the mediators released to control the infecting organism, they work both against the infecting organism or may not work against the infecting organism, but may work against the host itself. So this is where the sepsis comes into picture. And we end up dealing with them with varying outcomes. So, as you can see here, sepsis is mediated by 
various inflammatory mediators like interleukin-6, TNF-alpha, interleukin-1, beta, and almost every part of the body is affected. Uh, the heart, liver, spleen, lung, kidney, brain, everything, everything is affected. And the, the final common pathway seems to be with, with the mitochondria. So the expression of inducible nitric oxide synthase, this leads to synthesis of various uh, um, 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 oxidants or infective metabolites. Um, and this leads to endothelial dysfunction and loss of endothelial barrier function. And also results in occlusion of capillaries and myocardial, impaired myocardial contractility grossly. This is the pathogenesis, okay? And as I said, the mitochondria seems to be the final organelle affected by sepsis. There is mitochondrial dysfunction because insufficient oxygen is delivered to the mitochondria and there is excessive generation of nitric oxide, carbon monoxide, hydrogen sulfide, and reactive oxygen species. And also there is hormone-induced alteration in the function of mitochondria and down-regulation of mitochondrial gene transcription proteins. And this seems to be the final common pathway of sepsis. Whatever might be the reason for sepsis, this is the final common pathway. 